So welcome everybody. My name is Malki Assad and I'm hosting a lecture series to aid medical students and residents in getting a better idea about conduction of research studies, research design, writing and statistical analysis. Our topic today is responsible research conduct, which will cover the IRB process as well. For those who, hasn't, uh, who haven't filled the pre-course assessment, please uh, fill that assessment. is going to take two minutes, covering demographics and knowledge about this topic. So there are three forms of response of research misconduct, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. And we'll start with fabrication. So fabrication is making up data and results that doesn't exist. And a easy example of that is just publishing a paper that you didn't do, you didn't do the study at all. It's different from falsification, which we'll talk about later, but fabrication is just making up your results and publishing a paper about that, although no study has happened. Uh, a good example of that is Dr. Fuji, who is considered the world champion of plagiarism of uh, fraud and fabrication. Dr. Fuji is a Japanese anesthesiologist, and he had the main research focus focus of nausea and vomiting following surgery. He holds the record of the largest number of papers that were fabricated. Can you imagine that he wrote almost 180 papers, and all of these studies were fabricated. There was no studies done. We just made up the results, wrote the papers, and published them. Uh, after several years of fabrication, all his papers were, were retracted and he was dismissed from his position. So this is a very serious issue. Uh, it's not always captured, but if it does, it leads to major problems. Falsification is manipulating your data. So let's say you have a study and uh, you find that certain results are not congruent with the previous literature. So you just start make, changing your results in order to make your results look nicer. And easy example of that could be, for example, you, you didn't like the, the Western blot on, your, on your, one of your graphs, so you go and change that. Uh, let's say one of your results was an outlier. In order to change your results, you go and just take that outlier out. So this is another serious issue. Uh, it's different from fabrication in that there's, there was actually a study. So the study happened, but you're manipulating your data in order for it to make, to, to be better study. Uh, while fabrication, the whole study didn't exist and you just, uh, you go and you, I'm just I'm admitting some people that are getting into the session. So the fabrication, the study doesn't exist. While falsification, the study existed, but you're changing your results. Uh, the famous example of that is Dr. Wakefield, who's a British GI doctor, and he's famous for his MMR vaccine study that was published in Lancet in 1998. In this study, Dr. Wakefield showed an association between the MMR vaccine and autism, autism, and it was found later that this study was falsified, although the study happened, but the author changed the results in order to show an association between the MMR vaccine and autism. And we're dealing with the consequences of that falsified study till now. Millions of people in the US and Europe don't vaccinate their children because of this falsified study. Uh, Dr. Wakefield lost his medical license as a result of this study, and the, it took the Lancet almost 12 years to retract this study. Plagiarism is the third form of research misconduct. And this could be seen as the least as the least bad of the three, but it also can lead to major problems. So plagiarism is taking somebody else's ideas, results, without giving appropriate re reference or credit. And this could apply to text, data, or figures. Uh, sometimes it's acceptable to take somebody else's text, but you have to give appropriate credit. So if you want to use, let's say, uh, you find a nice sentence in an introduction of another study and you want to use that, that uh, same structure. In order to, use, to do that, you can either uh, put that sentence in between parentheses and give appropriate reference to the study you're taking that uh, text from. Another way is rephrasing that, that uh, sentence and we'll talk about that later. But it's not acceptable to take word by word, even if you reference the, the, art, the, the study without doing the parentheses. And it's also not acceptable to take it without appropriate credit. There is something called self-plagiarism or text recycling. So many people think that if I'm taking my text 
from previous studies. So let's say I published a study uh, about heart failure and I wrote a nice introduction. I don't write the same introduction again. So I just take that text from my previous introduction because it's my work. I'm not like, taking the text from somebody else. It's my work. So I'm just taking using my own words. That's not allowed. Even taking your own text is not allowed and you should apply your, the criteria to yourself as if it was another author, since it was already published. Uh, journals have very advanced programs of detecting plagiarism. The Authenticate is one uh, good example of that, and it screens millions of records online. So this is much easier to detect than falsification and fabrication. So paraphrasing is the one most commonly performed, and it's okay to do that. What does par paraphrasing mean? Paraphrasing means taking some, using your own words to describe somebody else's idea, plus giving an appropriate reference. So let's say here, here's an example of, of a source. The green one is the, the source. And the source says, the rapid growth and accessibility of social networks websites have fundamentally changed the way people manage information about their personal and professional lives. The acceptable example is example two, which is using your own words to describe, I'm sorry, example one is the acceptable one, which is called paraphrasing, which is using your own words to describe the same idea. It's fine to use certain words from, from the same source, but you have to give appropriate credit. But you can't just take word by word. And example two is an example of the word by word. Let's say we start from the people manage information. So we're starting how people manage information, which is the second part of the source, and we didn't take it word by word. We just use people manage information, but we change the structure. So we say how people manage information online has drastically altered the altered due to the proliferation of social network websites. So they start with the second paragraph, they change the structure, use certain words, but that's fine. And then they ended it with the first paragraph, first part of the sentence. They say that journals allow up to three words. It changed between journals, some journals allow five, so it varies, but I would say it's safe to use combination of three words. So here, people manage information, people manage information, it's fine, but you can't use more than that. And you have to change the structure. You can't just, you know, change word here and there like the example two did. So what example two did is they used two words, then instead of growth, they used spawning, and then instead of accessibility, they used availability, and then you can see the same thing is going on. Instead of fundamentally, they use completely. Um, and the rest of the sentence is the same. So this is not acceptable. So even if you do use the three words uh, rule, it doesn't apply if you're changing a word between every two or three words, but the structure of the sentence is, is the same. So if, if you want to use somebody else's words, you can use a word from here and there, but you have to change the structure. It's okay to keep the idea, but you have to give appropriate credit. So you can't say, oh, I changed the structure. It's now my own and I can just claim it as my own. No, you have to change the structure. You can use the same idea and you have to give appropriate credit. One way of doing that is you just read the text, you understand the concept, put that text aside and then rewrite it using your own. As long as the text stands in front of you, you won't be able not to plagiarize. If you want to stop the plagiarism, just put that text aside and you, you use your own words to describe the same concept. And this is different from the, the plagiarism, which is, as we said, either taking word by word or changing a few words. If you want to use word by word like this exact same thing, if it was a definition or something, it's fine, but you have to put it between parentheses. You can't use it without parentheses and you have to have the reference and you can't do that more than one or twice in your article you can't have your article or all between parentheses how research misconduct is detected so usually the common way of having people report research mis misconduct is people is whistleblowers people from your lab they notice something wrong going on and they tell the institution and you know you get caught or there are statistical methods in uh, in certain websites can detect that this can't happen. This is, this is, this is not uh, true. This couldn't happen. The results doesn't make sense together. So the most common way that Mr. Whistleblower's statistical analysis can also detect sometimes the, the fabrication and falsification. Uh, 
Institutions, institutions usually have a process for, for detecting and investigating the research misconduct. And both the whistleblowers and the accused are usually protected until a decision is made. What are the consequences of research misconduct? First, it erodes the trust of public in research outcomes. Public don't trust the study results anymore because they know that if it happens once, it can happen twice, and they think that every study is, is not true. Uh, it can damage the individual. The punishment depends on the type of misconduct. It can go from jail to firing the, the doctor accused of misconduct to stopping grants. And the most, I, I believe that the worst damage is the reputation because once your reputation as a researcher is screwed, your whole career is screwed because nobody trusts your work anymore. It can affect the institution you're working in and it ha can lead to major public health issues like the MR vaccine we talked about. So what is dual submission? Dual submission is submitting the same article to two journals at the same time because it takes a long time for journals to make a decision on, a, on an article. And sometimes you, people say, you know, we submitted an article to a journal and after six months they rejected it and now we have to submit again. So why don't we submit to the same, to several journals at the same time? And if it's accepted in one, in one journal, we can tell the other journals, you know what, our article got published there. That is not allowed, that's a major issue. If, if you do that, you might get fired from your position, you'll, you'll be banned from submitting to that journal uh, and you, articles might be retracted, so don't do that. This is a major issue and whenever you submit an, ar an article, you have to sign that your article has only been submitted to that journal. Duplicate submission is trickier because you're submitting a different article but almost the same results. So an example could be, uh, I, I published an article about heart failure with 500 patients, drug A versus placebo. So after, after a few months, I published another article with 500 patients and five. So I add five patients, my results look almost the same. There is nothing new. and uh, There is significant overlap between the two studies. So even though the text is, is different, I made different changes to my results, but the outcomes are almost the same. So this is also not allowed and can lead to retraction of both studies. And once you have a retracted article on your CV, that's, that's a major hit to your academic career. There are always exceptions. So let's say you have a, an article in, uh, Pain, pain medications, and this article could be of interest to uh, pain medicine journal and neurologist. So you can ask the editors, you know what, I have an article that could be of interest to both. If I publish it in neurology journal, the pain medicine people might not get that article. So one way of doing that is talking to the editors, explaining everything, telling them that this is the situation, and reference both articles. So you have to make things clear. But generally, don't submit the same article to two journals at the same time don't submit an article with significant overlap to another journal. Whenever you're writing an IRB or submitting an article, you have to disclose all your interests. They're financial or you have a family relation or even, for example, you're reviewing a paper for your friend and you like that person and you'd like to accept that article, you shouldn't do that. You should disclose that you have a, a conflict of interest. Uh, if, for example, you're an author and you're writing an, art, an article about uh, certain drugs in a company that you hold shares in uh, and you're, you're biased to show that this drug works because that will give you financial gain. So you have to tell the journal and the, the IRB that you have this conflict of interest. That won't ban you from publishing the study, but people want to know what conflict of interest do you have. And uh, this is also a major issue. So it's fine to have interest financial interests that you have to disclose them, but if you don't disclose them, that would lead to major issues. Authorship, this could be a total, uh, totally separate topic by itself, but just briefly, uh, the first author is the one that does most of the work. Senior author is the one that provides, senior means the last author, is the one that provides guidance and support, mentorship through your project. There is certain guidelines that uh, identifies what, who can be an author and who not. Mainly you have to uh, do a significant amount of contribution to that project. So even if you're not first and, and senior, if you're like third or fourth or fifth, you have to do a significant amount of work with the article and the design of the study, and you have to approve the final draft of the paper. 
there is always vulnerability of students because let's say you're working in a, in a lab and you want a letter of recommendation from your PI and they ask you to be second author or third author on the paper that you should be first. So here students are always in a vulnerable position because they, they want something other than the article which is their mentor support. Ghost authors are the ones that did the most work and they're not on the paper. Gift authors are the opposite. They're the ones who did almost nothing and they were gifted an authorship. These things are not allowed, can also lead to major issues if they're discovered. So now we're gonna cover the IRB. IRB is a group of people who uh, review and monitor research involving human subjects. So whenever you have research involving human subjects, you have to have an IRB. There is a lot of information regarding the history and the structure of the IRB. I provided that in the reference and you can look at that. Uh, but the main purpose of the IRB is to protect the rights and the welfare of people participating in research. When do I need an IRB? If I'm doing research, that involves human subjects. So both has to be uh, there in order for you to, have an, to need an IRB. And research is not any article that is published is considered research. For, ex for example, uh, if you're writing a case report about uh, one or two patients, that, that won't qualify as research. Because research is a systematic investigation that can lead to generalizable knowledge. This varies between institutions, but generally single case reports or small case series, maybe two to five, are not eligible for an IRB. So you can just do the study, but you need an approval of the patient if certain criteria are met. So especially if you're using pictures of the patients, but generally one to two case reports are, are, are fine. Uh, and the human subjects, for example, systematic review is a study, it's research, but it doesn't involve human subjects because you, you're reviewing articles from the literature. You're not using humans in your, in your study. The quality improvement projects, they're not considered research. So if you're doing quality improvement project, sometimes you can ask the IRB, but generally they, they don't need an IRB quality improvement project because they're not published. Once you publish a quality improvement project, here you would need an IRB. Uh, human subject, uh, if you're doing a review article, for example, other than systematic review, you're also looking at literature, you don't need an IRB. If you're doing a publication analysis, let's say you're assessing the, the impact factor of journals or publication times, it doesn't involve humans, so you don't need an IRB. So generally, case reports, small case series, systematic review, publication analysis, anything that doesn't involve a human don't, doesn't need an IRB. So the IRB process, after you write your protocol, you submit IRB, it either go to full re review, expedited, exempt. Sometimes they ask you for revisions, sometimes not. If they, if, if they accept the, pay, the protocol perfect, you can go ahead with your study. If they ask for modification, you modify your, your protocol. If they, if they reject it, you have to see why they rejected it and do a different study with uh, addressing the problem that was found in the previous design. Usually full board is for more serious stuff uh, that involve more than minimal risk, like you're doing a surgery for patients. So this is more than minimal risk. It would go to full review. Full board would take more time, more people would be reviewing it. Expedited review is, faster than the usual. It's usually minimal risk studies like surveys or uh, chart reviews. The exempt studies, uh, similar. So ex exempt is similar to expedited. It's faster than expedited. It varies between institutions. For example, when I was at Mayo, in, in the first few months, the chart review studies, which is you just go and look at patient charts without any risk to the patients, uh, they were considered expedite, expedited. And then the rules change and they made it exempt. Here at MD Anderson, they have the, the rule as uh, chart reviews as expedited. So it varies between institutions. You have to ask your own IRB, where does your study fall? So it depends on the study design and the risk of that study. I have an example of the IRB protocol here. So there is always a template at your institution for the IRB. If there is no IRB at your institution, you either can take an approval from IRB of a different institution or uh, ask, for example, the head of the hospital or the, the dean of the, the school to start some kind of process or paper approval for that uh, thing. Usually the protocol have a similar templates across institutions, but you just need to download that and fill it. 
This is an example of uh, IRB protocol. You start with the principal investigator, which is your mentor, because you as a young researcher can put yourself as a principal in investigator. So you always need somebody who is more senior to be the principal investigator. Uh, study title. Here I'm giving an example of patients who have lumpectomy versus mastectomy for breast cancer. So breast cancer, when it's surgically managed, they either take part of the breast or they remove the whole breast. And there's a deb debate about whether taking the whole breast is safer than part of the breast. Several studies. So we'll go through an uh, IRB protocol about that. They ask you sometimes for the version and the date. Version because they, they might revise the, the protocol multiple times. So they want to keep track of, you know, this is second version, third version of the study. You usually study your IRB protocol with background. Uh, background of the study. So how is your study, uh, uh, what is known about this topic? And then you will start talking about what is new and what your tr tr study is trying to achieve. So if, if I'm a lay person, I have no idea about your topic. In a few sentences, I want to know what, your, what is the current knowledge about this topic. So this is a, a background from a New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper on the mice trial, mastectomy versus lumpectomy. So the author started his introduction uh, or background of the topic by talking how mastectomy was the standard of care and that it was morbid and surgeons started doing something else because it's less morbid procedure because it's, uh, it's, you're removing the whole breast while you can achieve the similar results with less morbid procedure. So this is how the author uh, mentioned his background, that surgery A was morbid. Surgeons started noticing dissatisfaction with the results. They found good results with the, with the, new, with the, with the new technique, which is lumpectomy. So this is now I have an idea about the topic. I know that surgery A was more morbid. It has been performed previously. More people are trying the new one and it's achieving similar results. Now you start. Before we, we go to the hypothesis and aim, one way to get a good background of your study is just look in the literature at the introduction of similar studies. Because most of the time, you're not the first one writing about this topic. There is always you know, something like this in the literature. So don't plagiarize, but you can have an idea from previous studies in the literature, from their introductions. Uh, then you start talking about the hypothesis and aims. Hypothesis is what you expect your results to be. It's kind of you know predicting the future. Uh, for this study, let's say an example could be we hypothesize that the less extensive procedure, which is the lumpectomy, can yield similar outcomes, similar survival, similar local recurrence at the big surgery. What is your aim? What is the goal of this study? Is to determine whether the less surgery, less extensive surgery, can give similar survival to the bigger surgery, which is the mastectomy. Sometimes study have secondary aims, which is you know, our main outcome is survival. But you know, I might have another outcome, which is difference in complication rates or patients who have positive lymph nodes. Do they uh, have different survival compared to patients who have negative lymph nodes? So it's different aims, but you should always have a main aim, which is main, the, your main aim, and then you can have secondary aims. So you mentioned that in your protocol. Then you start your methods, which can include the study design, We'll talk about different designs of studies, but mainly retrospective, prospective, randomized trial, how you're collecting your data, what data are you collecting, what's your inclusion exclusion criteria, what is the timeline of the study, and what is the sample size. So this is an example of the, the, the methods protocol. We start, this is a retrospective study of patients who had this surgery at our institution, the timeline, and then we say that the data was collected from the medical records and what data we're collecting. So hey, I, I mentioned an example, date of diagnosis, cancer type, date of surgery, type of surgery, T and M. So you mentioned the data that you're trying to collect. Then you mentioned the sample size that you expect to collect, which is, can vary, but you know, the IRB understand that this is not 100% accurate, but just an estimation. So you're looking at 1,000 or 100 or 10,000. So an example could be 1,000 here. The inclusion criteria, which patients are eligible for the study and which not. So mention, for example, females over 18 or under 18 or all ages, biopsy confirmed or not biopsy confirmed. It varies between them. This is just an example. Ex exclusion could be, for example, patients who have this mutation are not eligible for the study. So you exclude them. You have to explain these things to the IRB. 
And then you talk about the data analysis. How do you expect your data to be analyzed? Are you using mean, median, Kaplan-Meier analysis, regression analysis, Cook's proportional hazard model? So what the data that you're trying to, to uh, how are you trying to analyze your data? Uh, essential part of the, of this IRB protocol is the power analysis. Not, it's not always there, but sometimes they ask about it. So power analysis is how many patients do you need or how much, how much is your sample size in order to detect a certain difference. So let's say if I want to detect a 10% difference in survival between the two patient, two groups, I need a sample size of, let's say, 100 patients if I want to detect 80% power and at this significance. This will be covered more under the statistical analysis course, but this is just an idea that you have to mention the power analysis usually in your protocol. Data conf confidentiality, you have to explain to the IRB where the data will be stored because your data will have protected health information, patient identif identifiers, like the medical record number or the patient name, emails. Uh, so these patient, these patient identifiers and the protected health information need to be stored somewhere safe, like your institution uh, drives, because these all are always behind firewalls and you can't just store it on your personal PC because people can hack that, that data and can lead to major, major issues. So you have to explain that there's, usually there are templates for these sections, the confidentiality and the consent that I'll mention now. Uh, just use these templates and be sure to keep your data behind the, the institution firewalls. Informed consent, for usually for prospective studies uh, or greater than minimal risk, you need to have patients uh, sign a written consent. Uh, this is the most difficult part of the IRB for these studies because the IRB takes, is careful about every single wording in that document because it's a legal document. So if something happens to the patient and they decided to sue the hospital, they, they can show the, that the patient signed for, for this procedure. Uh, but at, at research fellows level, medical student level, usually they're not involved in these big studies. Uh, it's more of a either oral consent or waiver of consent. Oral consent if the study, uh, this decision goes to the IRB. If the study can go to the oral versus written, but survey studies usually they're 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 oral. Oral. If you're just talking to patients over the phone, they can provide oral consent. Uh, so the decision goes to the IRB. Waiver of consent is usually done for retrospective studies and chart reviews. So you have a study looking at the charts of 100 patients of the lumpectomy versus versus the mastectomy. You ask IRB for a waiver of consent, which means you're asking the IRB not to collect. The, the, the consent because first the study is, is not, uh, uh, doesn't hold more than minimal risk to the patient. It's not practical to call the patients for a consent because may, they might have been lost to follow up or died. So the IRB usually approves uh, a waiver of consent for, for this kind of studies. So just ask in your institution what the rules there and use the templates they use. Then you have to submit to the IRB website. Once you submit to the IRB website, it, it follows the same, uh, the same usually general template, which is you upload your protocol, you list the collaborators of the study, who's going to be working on this study, uh, the confidentiality, the, the consent, the protocol, you list everything there. And it varies between institutions, but it generally follows the same outline. Uh, and what all the things I talked today, covering human subjects. So animal studies doesn't fall under IRB. They, they fall under something they call the IACUC. And this won't be covered in our course, but if somebody is interested in animal studies, they can look at the IACUC and see how the protocol for these things work. We'll, follow, we'll, we'll do the post uh, course assessment after the questions. We have a few minutes for questions, so if anyone has a question, can, uh, they can send it in the chat. Any questions? Perfect. Uh, please uh, let me please type the the pre-course post-course assessment 
uh, it's similar questions to the pre-course, just to see how your knowledge improved and if you, need, you have any suggestions for this course. I would like to thank you very much for attending this course today. If you like this uh, lecture, please uh, share it on your social media platforms. My Instagram and Twitter accounts are at Melke Asad. I will share this uh, on YouTube and share it on my Instagram too. Thank you very much. Thanks.